On this episode of China Uncensored, is Hong Kong the next Tibet? Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. Did I say, is Hong Kong the next Tibet? What I meant to say is, is Hong Kong the next Tibet? Think about it. Since the Communist Party took over, Tibet has gone from a backwards, feudalistic land ruled by the iron fist of the slave master lamas to the prosperous land we know today. Why, of the four cities in China that have breathable air, one is Lhasa. And look at this beautiful scenery. Before, it was cluttered up with monasteries, over 6,000. Thanks to the Chinese Communist regime, by 1976, that number was reduced to eight. I know, some of you say I'm too critical of China and are probably assuming I'm going to make fun of them for not finishing off those other eight. But hey, you know, I'm not. I mean, they were so busy burning down things inside of mainland China back then, and there's only 24 hours in a day, there's a limit to how much you can destroy, even for the communists. Why, mainland rule is so beloved, the Tibetan people welcomed a proposed law that would replace their own language with Mandarin in schools. Can't you hear them cheering? They're so excited! Anyway, the Mandarin thing is handy because the place is getting flooded with Han Chinese moving into the region. And with snipers on every rooftop, you don't have to worry about dangerous religious fanatics anymore. So, if the People's Republic of China has been able to do so much in Tibet, just imagine what they could do in Hong Kong. And think about it, they took over Tibet in 1950. They've only been in charge of Hong Kong since 1997. Before that, Hong Kong was a barren wasteland. At least it was in the 1700s. I'm a little spotty on the history since. But look at it now. Oh yes, there are some exciting developments happening in Hong Kong. Many of the tried and true practices they've implemented in Tibet are already being used in Hong Kong to spectacular success. For example, erasing the native language. In Hong Kong, they speak Cantonese, which is also spoken in neighboring Guangdong in the mainland. Well, ever since the handover of Hong Kong back to the Chinese rule in 1997, they've been pushing Mandarin in Hong Kong. It's especially in schools. Why, state-run China Daily even suggests that Mandarin should be the only language used in public schools. Even great intellectuals like Peking University professor Kong Ching Dong suggests the same when he's not calling Hong Kongers bastards, thieves, and dogs. Mm. And with the influx of business from the mainland, some even think that in the near future, Mandarin will be the official language in business, school, and of course, the government. And the push for Mandarin has been pretty successful. Half the population can now speak Mandarin. Ten years ago, only a third of Hong Kong could. Actually, last year, Mandarin overtook English as the second most spoken language. And because Mandarin is the official language of mainland China, most Westerners are learning that and not Cantonese. I'm certainly guilty of that. Ironic, since the only part of China could actually visit would be Hong Kong. But there are some naysayers out there, namely about 85% of the population. According to a 2011 survey by Hong Kong University, only 16.6% .6 of Hong Kong residents identified themselves first as Chinese citizens. The others considered themselves Hong Kongers. They also did a poll where less than one in three people said they felt proud of Mandarin. Then there's the 90% who responded to a poll by the South China Morning Post that said they'd rather go back to British rule. But so then, who are all these people identifying themselves as Chinese? Well, it could be all the mainland Chinese flooding Hong Kong. They buy a baby formula, infuriating Hong Kong mothers who now don't have enough for their own children. Almost half of all births in Hong Kong since 2010 are to mainland mothers because children born there get Hong Kong residency. Housing prices have also skyrocketed by as much as 70% since 2009, according to research by Nomura, Japan's largest consulting and IT firm. That's because nearly one-fifth of the money made in real estate purchases were to people from mainland China. And now there's a housing shortage. Resentment in Hong Kong towards mainlanders is at an all-time high. In 2012, this full-page color ad was taken out in the popular Hong Kong newspaper, The Apple Daily, with a giant menacing locust perched on the mountains overlooking the Hong Kong skyline. I guess who the locust was supposed to represent. So, obviously, with such a serious issue, I bet the Hong Kong government is keeping a close eye on just how many mainlanders are now calling themselves Hong Kongers. Let's just pull up those figures. Oh, what's that? Ah, apparently they're not keeping track. But 
So it's not just polls, housing prices, the job market, and language these mainland settlers are going to be able to influence. Currently, Hong Kong is ruled under the one country, two system policy. More on that here. <laughs> Street Fighter. Basically, Hong Kong is a part of China, but because Hong Kong was exposed to dangerous Western ideals like freedom and democracy, they weren't ready for full assimilation with the motherland. But don't worry, the CCP has been working hard to slowly erode all those pesky freedoms Hong Kongers have suffered under. The official head of Hong Kong is Chief Executive Lung Chun Ying. The chief executive is elected by 1,200 business leaders and influential citizens, and guess what? Most of them have close ties with Beijing. But the dreaded day is fast approaching when Hong Kong will have universal suffrage, and hostile foreign forces will be able to vote against the best interests of the party. I mean, I mean Hong Kong. Chinese authorities tried to stop it. Originally, they said the people of Hong Kong would get to decide when they'd have universal suffrage. The Hong Kong people won in 2007 or 8. Their government said 2012 at the latest. Fortunately, the CCP was able to stem the tide and got the date pushed back to 2017. But it can't be pushed back anymore. A massive protest is being planned for later this year called Occupy Central, where potentially thousands will demand universal suffrage. Okay, no problem. Let the people vote, because the Chinese regime has a secret weapon up their uh, proverbial sleeve. I choose you, gerrymander! Gerrymander! Oh, gerrymander, we share such a special bond. Gerrymandering is a political term that comes from the U.S. It was first used in the Boston Gazette in 1812. The governor of Massachusetts, Eldridge Gerry, redrew the electoral districts of Massachusetts into a bizarre salamander shape, hence gerrymander. So this gave his Democratic Republican Party a huge advantage in elections. Basically, the people voting were his people. Now, that was physically redrawing a district, but flooding a region with your own people so elections will turn out the way you want is pretty similar. Now, to vote in Hong Kong, you need to be a permanent resident. You get to be a permanent resident if you were born there, which, remember, is one of the reasons why mainland mothers have flooded Hong Kong hospitals to give birth, or you have lived there for at least seven years. So, Hong Kong wants to vote. Sure, no problem. But before that happens, the Chinese regime will make sure there are as many mainland Chinese people and businesses in Hong Kong as possible, all with their personal interests tied to the mainland, so that when elections do happen, well, let's just say they'll be super effective. And then, of course, there's a question of whether or not people with critical views of China will even be allowed to run for office. But can you really blame people from the mainland for wanting to get out? I mean, part of the reasons why so many mothers were giving birth in Hong Kong was because it was their second child. And because of the one-child policy, mothers might otherwise have suffered a forced abortion. Maybe that will change now that there's a two-child policy, but we'll see. Also, so much baby formula is being bought because the mainland variety has tended to be a bit uh, deadly. Not to mention the total lack of freedom, rampant corruption, and the fact that you can't breathe the air or drink the water in even the capital. But all this resentment is only breeding a cycle of hatred. The more you try and push them away, the greater the divide will be between Hong Kongers and mainlanders. You are fellow countrymen. Even though some people want it, Hong Kong is not going to be a part of Britain again. As for all the mainlanders coming to Hong Kong, they're calling you locusts because you're only taking from Hong Kong and not contributing much back other than potentially undermining the very things about Hong Kong that makes you want to go there. Hong Kong is the clearest example of how much better life would be for the Chinese without the CCP. Hong Kong is where mainland Chinese can see demonstrations and protests against the government. That's why the CCP is so afraid of you guys. Hong Kong can be a guiding light to the mainland. You should be changing China, not letting the Communist Party change you. Who knows? In the near future, Hong Kong could be the capital of a free and democratic China. So what do you think will happen come 2017? And what role do you think Hong Kong will play in the future of China? Tell me your thoughts in the comment section below. Be sure to subscribe, share with your friends, and check out the China Uncensored Facebook page for more. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.